On Valentine's Day 2013, a doctor was awoken by screams, followed by several gunshots. It had come from his neighbor's home, just 80 yards away. He jumped into action and ran to the home to see if he could possibly help. Upon entering the house, the doctor found Olympic athlete Oscar Pistorius kneeling over a woman covered in blood. That woman was Reva Steenkamp, Oscar's girlfriend of three months. She was lying on her back at the base of the stairs, and Oscar was cradling her. Two of his fingers were down Reva's throat, desperately attempting to open her airway. Oscar told the doctor, I shot her. I thought she was a burglar. I shot her. The doctor tried to maneuver her jaw to open her airway, but Reva's mouth was clenched tight, as if she'd been frozen in her intense reaction to the shots. The doctor recalls the events, stating, quote, In all during that time, there wasn't any signs of life that I could see. I opened her right eyelid. The pupil was fixed and dilated, and the cornea was milky. In other words, it was already drying out. So, to me, it was obvious that she was mortally wounded. While I was trying to ascertain if she was revivable, Oscar was crying all that time. He prayed to God, please let her live. She must not die. He said at one stage while he was praying that he will dedicate his life and her life to God if she would just only live and not die that night. But did Oscar really want Reva Steenkamp to live? Or was he performing for the doctor that just walked in on him holding his dead girlfriend? Maybe Oscar was being genuine. Maybe he did want Reva to live. But not because he truly valued her life. Because he was about to face the consequences of killing her. The man who shot and killed 29-year-old Reva Steenkamp was desperately trying to clean up the irreversible mess he created with a simple defense. He believed she was an intruder, so he shot her four times through a locked bathroom door. Authorities had another theory. They believed Reva's murder was premeditated, and they were going to try and prove it. Longtime friend Carrie Smith said that Reva Steenkamp was, quote, more than just a pretty face. She had a beautiful heart and ambition. Reva was born on August 19, 1983, in Cape Town, to Barry and June Steenkamp. Her stunning beauty would become something she was most known for in the public eye. Her first professional shoot occurred at age 15. The photographer of this shoot knew that Reva was going places. Reva was always the first to arrive and last to leave at a shoot, and this work ethic would carry her into a successful career in modeling, but Reva still placed her education as a top priority. She and Carrie met in 2002 at university, where they were both studying law. As freshmen, they were both in the top 10 of their class. During Reva's college years, she spent most of her time studying and riding the horses her father trained. A tragedy would happen during her senior year that would completely change her perspective on life. After falling off of one of her father's horses, she broke her back and was left bedridden for two months. Looking back on the incident, Carrie believed this was the moment that Reva realized that life was incredibly short, and a healthy body is something a lot of us take for granted. After graduating university with a law degree in 2005, Reva started to take her modeling career more seriously. But in the back of Reva and Carrie's mind, they were still holding on to the plans they made to start a law firm to help abused women. One of Reva's determinations after college was to become FHM's cover girl. She was denied after two auditions, but never gave up hope. Carrie stated, quote, she was determined to get that job. Reva was the kind of person who didn't take no for an answer. She worked hard and lost weight, reinvented herself, and it paid off. In December of 2011, the newly blonde, 
was featured on the cover of FHM magazine, but her feats didn't stop there. She was featured in an array of magazines and appeared on television several times, including a reality show and as a presenter for a fashion channel. In November of 2013, three months before her murder, Riva began a relationship with Oscar Pistorius. First, let's take a look at Oscar's first-hand account of who he thinks he truly is. In 2009, he published an autobiography titled Blade Runner, My Story, Oscar Pistorius. In the first paragraph, Oscar writes, quote, To tell you the truth, I don't think of myself as disabled. I have limits, but we all have limits. And like anyone else, I also have my talents. My brother, sister, and I were brought up with one iron rule. No one was allowed to say, I can't. At the age of 17, Oscar was chosen to represent South Africa at the Athens Paralympics. There, he broke a world record and beat the reigning world champion. Oscar stated, Unbeknownst to me, my victory and my status as gold medalist at the Athens Paralympics 2004 had changed my life forever. I became a sporting celebrity overnight, and the media interest and the angle they chose elevated me to a superhero for disabled people worldwide. When the news broke that he had shot and killed Riva, one of his exes was quick to defend him by tweeting, quote, Not once has he ever lifted a finger to me or made me fear for my life. Another woman he dated the same year as the killing, Samantha, had a different experience. Samantha had been Pistorius' longtime girlfriend, just 17 when a 24-year-old Pistorius swept her off her feet. I heard him screaming at Samantha once on the phone, yelling. Through the phone? Yeah, through the phone, with foul language. That shocked me. Were you ever frightened of his temper? Oh yeah, definitely. You say he would shout at you. For what? I didn't take my plate to the kitchen. He would shout at you for not taking your plate to the kitchen? Yeah. She said life with the Blade Runner was like living on a razor's edge. He drove in the car with you at 200 miles an hour on a busy highway. If anything happens, you both are dead. How close do you think you came to death with Oscar? There were a couple times that we were quite close. Samantha was in the back seat of a car with Pistorius and a friend when Pistorius fired his gun. He shot out the roof. Of so before you knew it, he suddenly shot out into the roof. Yeah. I think Oscar was an accident waiting to happen. He was the bullet in the chamber, the Nike ad. The guy who was always, something was going to happen. In a sense, it was all leading up to some tragedy. That's because Samantha and her mother say Pistorius was deeply unstable. Not the confident champion everyone else saw, but an emotional wreck. The man some thought turned on the tears for courtroom theatrics, <laughs> according to Samantha, was truly a constant crier. One of the defenses Oscar would have during his murder trial was that he didn't know Riva was in the bathroom because she was quiet. Her friend Carrie refuted this, stating, quote, she was not a quiet person at all. She would have screamed. Hearing him shout in the house, she would have let it rip. She would not have kept her mouth shut at all. Three weeks before Oscar shot and killed Riva, he applied for firearm licenses for two revolvers, a rifle, and three shotguns. While out on bail, Oscar Pistorius' pretrial hearing was set for August 19th, 2013, what would have been Riva's 30th birthday. His trial began on March 3rd, 2014, by pleading not guilty to premeditated murder and three firearms charges, unrelated to the killing. Oscar was surrounded by many supporters in the courtroom, including his family, who periodically placed their hand on his shoulder for comfort. The year prior, Oscar was making history as the first double amputee track athlete to compete in the Olympics. Now, he was potentially going to spend the rest of his life in prison. During his cross-examination, Oscar was probed about the details of his actions on the morning of the murder. He told the prosecutor that he heard an intruder and believed that they had locked themselves in the bathroom. It was dark, and he believed Riva was still in bed beside him and wanted to put him in between her and the danger. 
instead of having any sort of conversation with her, he immediately grabbed a gun and rushed to the hallway outside the bathroom. Oscar claimed that while standing there, he screamed for the person to get out of his house and screamed at Riva to phone the police. He repeated that several times. He told the court that there was no response from Riva. While standing in the hallway, Oscar heard a door slam. The bathroom is massive, and the toilet has its own tiny room, with a door separating it. This is the door that supposedly slammed. Oscar told the court that he believed an intruder used a ladder to climb into the bathroom and then locked themselves inside the toilet room. He reiterated to the court that he screamed at the intruder and for Riva to phone police. At this point, Riva was just three meters away from him, locked inside the toilet. Oscar claimed that she never once said a word to him. The prosecutor didn't believe this story, stating, quote, It's not possible. It's not probable. She would be scared. She would shout out and talk to you. You're in the same room. Oscar said he believed Riva must have kept quiet because she was scared of the intruder. The prosecutor responded, She wasn't scared of anything, except you. She wasn't scared of an intruder. She was scared of you. Did she scream at all whilst you shot her four times? Oscar simply responded, no. Oscar's story of that night is conflicted by the testimony of three neighbors. According to Oscar, he and Riva went to bed that night peacefully, and that was the last time he had conversed with her. This is what the neighbor, Michelle, heard, according to her testimony. Michelle said, It was an evening like any other evening. We went to bed between nine and ten. After three, I woke up hearing a woman's screams. Michelle told the court she called the neighborhood security guards to tell them her neighbors were being attacked. And just after the screams, she heard four gunshots, and that there was a longer pause between the first and second shots, and that pause was longer than the rest of the three shots. The next morning at work, she learned about the reality of the events through her husband, that Oscar had shot Riva, thinking she was an intruder. Michelle told her husband that that story didn't match what she heard that night. She told the court, quote, It was very traumatic for me, blood-curdling screams, anxiousness, and fear. I heard her screams again. It was worse. It was more intense. Just after her screams, I heard four shots. It was four gunshots I heard. Oscar stated that Riva never screamed, that she never said a word, and his defense was that the screams that Michelle heard were actually his own. Michelle went on stating, I agree there were four gunshots and a man screaming, but I also heard petrified screams of a woman. The fear in that woman's voice is difficult to explain to the court. Oscar's defense team argued that Michelle was speculating about the events and adapting her testimony so that it would fit. Michelle continued, I heard screaming, then I heard her call for help. Then I heard a man call for help three times. Afterwards, I heard a petrified scream. Then I heard four gunshots. A moment or two after the shots was the last time I heard her. I was convinced that woman was being attacked. She and her husband were being attacked in their house. Fear in her voice. Describing Riva's screams, Michelle said, You only scream like that if your life is really threatened. It was something that leaves you cold. The defense asked Michelle if what she actually heard could have been the screams of Oscar, and the gunshots she thought she heard could have been the sound of a cricket bat that Oscar used to break down the door after realizing he shot Riva. Michelle responded, I'm sure the gunshots would be louder than a cricket bat hitting the door. I know a gunshot really travels far. I very clearly heard two people a male and a female, shouting, the fear in that woman's voice, you only fear like that if your life is threatened. The defense refuted her claim that Michelle heard Riva scream after the gunshots. They claimed that Riva was too severely injured by the gunshots to scream after. They said it was impossible. But what about that pause between the first shot and the following three? The defense also argued that because Michelle's home was nearly 200 yards away, that she would not have been able to hear emotion and fear growing in the screams from inside their home. 
Michelle backed up her statements by saying that their windows were open because they didn't have air conditioning. Michelle left the witness stand looking upset, according to reports. The next witness was called up for questioning. It's another neighbor named Estelle. Estelle said that she woke up around 2 a.m. the morning of the murder to people talking in loud voices as if fighting. She said this lasted for roughly an hour. She managed to fall back asleep and was awoken around 3 a.m. to four gunshots. Her husband looked out the window but couldn't see anything and called security. Shortly after the shots, she heard someone, quote, crying out loud. Like Michelle's testimony, the defense tried to argue against it, stating that the screams would have been Oscar, not Reva. But Estelle was firm in her beliefs that she heard a woman screaming. She said she knows a woman's voice when she hears it, especially if that woman is angry. Johnson, the husband of Michelle, testified directly after. His account is nearly exact to that of his wife's. He said that he heard the voice of a woman who was in trouble, and that she was clearly in distress. Johnson went on to say, quote, I remember during the succession of shots, I heard a lady scream again, and shortly after the last shot. Oscar wanted the court to truly believe that he felt that there was an intruder in his home threatening his life behind a locked door, and that he believed the intruder could have possibly climbed a nearly 10-foot high wall and electric fence, and then used a ladder to get to his second-story bathroom. Now, let's get into the alarming messages exchanged by Oscar and Riva. On January 26th, 20 days before her death, Riva texted Oscar the following. I'm not 100% sure why I'm sitting down to type you a message first, but perhaps it says a lot about what's going on here. Today was one of my best friend's engagements, and I wanted to stay longer. I was enjoying myself, but it's over now. You have picked on me incessantly since you got back from CT, and I understand that you are sick, but it's nasty. Yesterday wasn't nice for either of us, but we managed to pull through and communicate well enough to show our care for each other is greater than the drama that attacked us. I was not flirting with anyone today. I feel sick that you suggested that, and that you made a scene at the table and made us leave early. I'm terribly disappointed in how the day ended and how you left me. We are living in a double standard relationship, where you can be mad about how I deal with stuff when you are very quick to act cold and offish when you're unhappy. Every five seconds I hear how you dated another chick, you really have dated a lot of people yet you get upset if I mention one funny story with a long-term boyfriend. I do everything to make you happy and to not say anything to rock the boat with you. You do everything to throw tantrums in front of people. I have been upset by you for two days now. I'm so upset I left Darren's party early. So upset. I can't get that day back. I'm scared of you sometimes and how you snap at me and of how you will react to me. You make me happy 90% of the time, and I think we are amazing together. But I am not some other bitch you may know trying to kill your vibe. I am the girl who let go with you, even when I was scared out of my mind to. I am the girl who fell in love with you, and wanted to tell you this weekend. But I'm also the girl that gets sidestepped when you are in a shit mood. I feel like you think you have me, so why try anymore? I get snapped at and told my accents and voices are annoying. I touch your neck to show you I care and you tell me to stop. Stop chewing gum. Do this. Don't do that. You don't want to hear stuff. Cut me off. Your endorsements, your reputation, your impression of something innocent blown out of proportion and fucked up a special day to me. I'm sorry if you truly felt... I was hitting on my friend Sam's husband. And I'm sorry that you think that little of me. From the outside, I think it looks like we are a struggle. And maybe that's what we are. I just want to love and be loved. Be happy and make someone so happy. 
maybe we can't do that for each other. Because right now, I know you aren't happy. And I'm certainly very unhappy and sad. To this message, this was Oscar's response, which is mostly filled with excuses. Quote, I want to talk to you. I want to sort this out. I don't want to have anything less than amazing for you and I. I'm sorry for the things I say without thinking and for taking offense to some of your actions. The fact that I'm tired and sick isn't an excuse. I was upset that you just left me after we got food to go talk to a guy, and I was standing right behind you watching you touch his arm and ignore me. And when I spoke up, you didn't introduce me, which you could have done. But when I left, you just kept on chatting to him when clearly I was upset. I asked Martin to put on that Kendrick Lamar album in the car and didn't know it. Granted, that was a shit song, but you could have just leant forward and whispered in my ear to change it since I had to drive to pick up your friend. I was 30 minutes late and I know you don't like it when I drive fast, but then you should have asked Gina to drive herself so that we wouldn't have to. When we left, I was starving. The only food I'd had was a tiny wrap and everyone was leaving for lunch. I'm sorry I wanted to go, but I was hungry and upset. And although you know it, it wasn't like you came to chat to me when I left the table. I was upset when I left you because I thought you were coming to me. I'm sorry I asked you to stop taping my neck yesterday. I know you were just trying to show me love. I had a mad headache and should have just spoken to you softly. I'm sorry for asking you not to put on an accent last night, pretty much the same, and didn't have much energy. After an argument broke out between them at an award show, this is the text she sent Oscar a week before her murder. Quote, I like to believe that I make you proud when I attend these kinds of functions with you. I present myself well and can converse with others whilst you are off busy chatting to fans slash friends. I also knew people there tonight, and whilst you were having one or two pics taken, I was saying goodbye to people in my industry, and Fix wanted a photo with me. I was just being cordial by saying goodbye while you were busy. I completely understood your desperation to leave, and I thought I would be helping by getting to the exit before you, because I can't rush in the heels I was wearing. I thought it would make a difference in us getting out without you being harassed by anyone. I didn't think you would criticize me so loudly so that others could hear. I might joke around and be all tomboyish at times, but I regard myself as a lady. And I didn't feel like one tonight after the way you treated me when we left. I'm a person too, and I appreciate that you invited me out tonight, and I realize that you get harassed. But I'm trying my best to make you happy and I feel as though you sometimes never are, no matter the effort I put in. I can't be attacked by outsiders for dating you, and be attacked by you, the one person I deserve protection from. If these texts between the couple weren't damning enough that they were having issues, Oscar also purposely deleted these WhatsApp messages before handing his phone and other devices over to police. After a long trial on September 11, 2014, a South African judge read her decision on the verdict, not guilty in the murder of Reva Steenkamp. Reva's family was shocked. June Steenkamp said this to NBC News, quote, He shot through the door, and I can't believe that they believe it was an accident. I just don't feel that this is the right sentence. Justice was not served. I won't believe his story, and that's the difference. I don't really care what happens to Oscar. It's not going to change anything, because my daughter is never coming back. He's still living and breathing, and she's gone, you know, forever. The trial wasn't over yet, though. The judge needed to decide if Oscar was guilty of culpable homicide, the equivalent of what we know as manslaughter. If he was found guilty, it would carry a significantly less sentence, the minimum being just five years. And this sentence could be served in the comfort of his own home, on house arrest, if the judge allowed. The next day, September 12th, the judge found 27-year-old Oscar Pistorius guilty of culpable homicide. 
he was also found guilty of accidentally discharging his gun under a restaurant table. This was a crime he texted Riva about, telling her not to tell anyone, and that another friend already promised to take the blame. He was found not guilty of the other two firearm charges, that included firing his weapon through a sunroof and the illegal possession of ammunition. In October, the judge handed down her sentence, first stating, quote, I am of the view that a non-custodial sentence would send a wrong message to the community. On the other hand, a long sentence would not be appropriate either, as it would lack the element of mercy. Oscar was sentenced to five years for culpable homicide and an additional three-year suspended sentence for the firearm conviction. He would be eligible for house arrest after 10 to 20 months in prison. Proper justice would come at first in the form of an appeal in 2015, the following year. Oscar was set to be released to house arrest on the 21st of August, after serving a sixth of his sentence. Shockingly, two days before this date, a justice minister blocked the parole board's decision. However, this was just a delay. Oscar was released from prison and allowed to live under house arrest in October of that year, just two months later. In December of 2015, the prosecution's appeal of the verdict reached the South African Court of Appeal. They overturned it and convicted Oscar Pistorius of murder. The Supreme Court scorned the verdict of the original judge, and this is what they had to say, referring to Oscar. Quote, He must have foreseen and therefore did foresee that the person he was firing at behind the door might be fatally injured. The interests of justice require that persons should be convicted of the actual crimes they have committed, not of lesser offenses. That is particularly so in crimes of violence. Despite the text messages showing domestic disturbances between the couple and Riva's screams that multiple neighbors heard, their decision to overturn the verdict didn't come from that. They overturned a verdict of culpable homicide because they believed it was clear that Oscar fired those bullets to kill whoever was on the other side of that locked door. It could have been Riva, a burglar, or anyone else. The key question was, did Oscar intend to kill the person behind the door? And did he foresee his actions killing someone, but proceeded to anyway? The Supreme Court believed he did, and in turn, it wasn't culpable homicide. This was murder. Oscar's defense team tried to appeal this verdict to the court, but was denied. And on July 6, 2016, the same judge that oversaw his case originally gave him a new sentence. Six years. Just one year more than her previous sentence. This lenient sentence was appealed again and made its way again to the Supreme Court of Appeal. On November 24, 2017, the court more than doubled his sentence and gave him the minimum for murder, 15 years in prison. This sentence, of course, would take into account the time he already served, so it was just an additional 13 years, 5 months. A spokeswoman for the Steenkamp family told the press, quote, They feel there has been justice for Riva. She can now rest in peace. But at the same time, people think this is the end of the road for them. The fact is, they still live with Riva's loss every day. In November of 2021, four years after receiving his 15-year sentence, Oscar became eligible for parole. The parole process for this particular case in South Africa would require a lot of steps. Oscar would have to acknowledge and take responsibility for Riva's murder and the parole board would have to take into account reports written by prison officials and other professionals that have examined Oscar. If Oscar was granted parole, he'd serve the remaining half of his sentence at home. This was a shock to Riva's family, because they didn't think he would become eligible until 2023. In an interview with the Times, Riva's mother June said, quote, Why? Why, my little girl? She had so much of herself to give, and now all of it is gone. Just like that, she is gone. In the blink of an eye and a single breath, 
the most beautiful person who ever lived, is no longer here. As of today, Oscar Pistorius remains in prison, but he will probably be released by 2023.